Wheaties Breakfast of Champions brings you John W. Vandercook, author, explorer, student of world politics, and famous news commentator. Mr. Vandercook. Good evening. In this critical period of the world's fortunes, the Axis leaders, in at least one respect, have been very lucky. With the possible exception of Attila and Alaric, Mussolini and Adolf Hitler have probably been more passionately hated by more people than any men who ever lived. Yet they have led charmed lives. There is no record even of any serious attempt ever having been made to assassinate Hitler. Pot shots have been taken at Mussolini, but bad luck and bad aim prevented their finding a vital spot. The devil, it would seem, does take care of his own. Today, there is a strong suggestion that that run of luck has ended. King Boris Geria died at dusk today. The cause of his death is officially uncertain. One account has it that the 49-year-old Tsar of the Bulgars was taken off by a severe heart attack. The Italians contradict that diagnosis and hint that in a few days the truth will be officially revealed. The German news service insists that King Boris suffered from an ailment of the lungs. Rumor insistently has it that both may be telling part of the truth, and that the real cause of Boris' death was a hot spurt of assassin's bullets which entered the region of the monarch's lungs and heart. The old iron and bronze bells in the square Byzantine towers of Bulgaria's innumerable churches and old monasteries told twenty times to mark his passing. Simeon, the only son of Boris and of his Italian consort, in fulfillment of the ancient formula, has become the new king. King Simeon II of Bulgaria is six years old. The fact of Boris' death and the succession jerks another prop from beneath the shaking axis structure. The name Bulgaria comes from an old Slavic root, which means the land of the plowing peasants. Its six and a half million people are blood cousins to the Russians. They have enjoyed the dignity of being citizens of a separate modern nation for only 35 years. During that brief period, through the ambition of their autocratic kings, they have been led twice into general European wars that they have neither understood nor wanted. Bulgaria was an ally of Germany, the loser in the last war and had the distinction of being the first of the Central Powers Alliance to accept unconditional surrender. That debacle resulted in the abdication of King Ferdinand in favor of his son Boris. Since then, the patient, strong-muscled people of Bulgaria have plowed their fertile fields, have grown their wheat and their tobacco, and mined their soft brown coal, caring little and knowing little of what was taking place in the troubled European world around them. In the interlude of peace, the late King Boris was for a time a popular figure. He was only 24 when he ascended the Bulgar throne. His marriage to the daughter of King Victor Emmanuel of Italy did not take place until 1930, when Boris was 36. As a bachelor, the young Tsar showed what at least in that part of Europe passed for democratic tendencies. He loved to drive fast cars and motorcycles over the narrow dirt roads of his kingdom. He was fascinated by railways and enjoyed nothing so much as running a locomotive with his own royal hands. The common people liked him. Then, with his marriage to a daughter of the ambitious House of Savoy, Tsar Boris began to repeat in detail the mistake of his father Ferdinand. The Germans again made promises. Boris fatally believed the Germans. For the second time, that little Balkan nation, no larger than the state of Kentucky, staked its national fortune on the wrong dark horse. The Bulgarian dynast wanted living space to the south. It is a deep-rooted national tradition that Bulgaria must secure an outlet to the Aegean Sea. That piece of the ancient land of Macedonia belonged to Greece. It is a brown and barren land of hills worn out by 4,000 years of human occupation. In exchange for an alliance with Germany, Hitler promised to deliver that desired territory. When the Nazis conquered Greece, the promise was kept. It was easy to keep. It cost Hitler nothing. In their anxiety to occupy that new living space, the Bulgarians under the directions of Tsar Boris are reported to have conducted themselves with gross brutality. The Greek goat herds and small peasants of the district have been driven out and starved and killed. Just what repayment Boris made, other than the empty gesture of alliance, is not quite clear. Racial and religious ties with the Russian people were too close for even the suppressed subjects of the king to stomach Bulgaria's joining in the attack on Russia. Bulgaria, therefore, is not at war with the Soviet Union. 
One has certainly not heard of any large masses of Bulgarian troops fighting beside the Nazis on the western or the Mediterranean fronts. Now the tragic farce is drawing to an end. The Bulgarians are openly weary of the war. They are bewildered by it. In sentiment, having met the Germans, they are now strongly pro-Allied and anti-Nazi. It must be a matter tonight of further concern to Berlin that Boris did not marry and beget an heir when he was younger. Poor Simeon II, at the age of six, will not be troubled by questions of high policy. Until he is of age or something happens, a regency will attempt to conduct Bulgarian affairs. Regencies notoriously, especially in times of war and crisis, are wobbly structures. They tremble in the cross wind of contradictory ambitions. Because his mother is Italian, one strong current will try to draw Bulgaria now into the stream of Italian policy. That stream seems headed for a waterfall. Nationalistic-minded Bulgarian politicians will fight that tendency hard. There is a large, communistically inclined peasants' party in Bulgaria. It has been brutally suppressed. It is by no means dis... It, too, will now try to make its strong and angry voice more audible. Balkan politics are immensely complicated. They lie outside American experience. Bulgaria, with astonishing completeness, has managed in one short lifetime to win the abiding hatred of the Romanians, the Turks, the Greeks, and the Yugoslavs, every neighbor she has without exception. The future of the young kingdom promises to be as dark as the future of the baby king. The Bulgarians tonight must be doing a lot of solemn thinking. The Germans are fully occupied in other countries. It may occur to some Bulgarians that the time may soon come when unconditional surrender to the great powers would be more than a good solution, it might even be sound insurance. For it would be far more profitable to Bulgaria to put itself under the protection of a well-fed lion and bear and eagle than to await the vengeance of the nearby hungry wolves. When the time does come for our diplomats to begin their dealings with Bulgaria, I have this bit of personal advice to offer them. The Bulgarians have a most peculiar habit. We could easily be misled by it into a serious misunderstanding. The Bulgarians, as I discovered after innumerable wrong turnings when I drove through their country some years ago, nod their heads when they mean no, and shake their heads when they mean yes. And now Glenn Riggs gives us one food expert's opinion on a vital problem of wartime nutrition. Perhaps you have noticed that our government campaign for better nutrition often draws particular attention to the need for a good breakfast every morning. Now, one reason for this is well stated in a prominent health magazine by a medical dietitian who says, hearty breakfasts contain the makings of alert, vigorous bodies and minds because they afford excellent opportunity to eat many protective foods, so-called because they provide food factors necessary for the maintenance of health. Now, uh, this statement points out once again that many of the foods we Americans reserve for the breakfast table are among the most important foods recommended for good nutrition. If we fail to eat these foods in the morning, very likely we may neglect to eat them at all. In this group of protective foods are fruits, whole grain cereals, milk, and eggs. And every breakfast should include these foods every morning as practical insurance that we're getting a good supply of nourishment at the start of the day. For your whole grain breakfast cereal every morning, we'd like to suggest Wheaties, Breakfast of Champions, America's favorite whole wheat flakes. We believe you'll like Wheaties. A lot. And now, back to Mr. Vandercook. Thank you, Mr. Riggs. Another small country it has been announced today lately suffered a rude shock. Portugal was a belligerent on our side during the last war and got singularly little out of it. This time, Portugal and the surprisingly large world empire of the Portuguese has managed to stay neutral. The worst shock to Portuguese neutrality occurred last year, when the Japs, without apology, moved into the Portuguese half of the South Sea island of Timor, just north of Australia. The Portuguese, because they could not help themselves, swallowed that insult. Today, typically, the Japanese have again insulted Portuguese neutrality. The small Portuguese-owned island of Macau, just off the coast of China at the mouth of the Pearl River, paradoxically is the only surviving European colony in the vast present area of the Japanese conquest. Macau is in the very middle of it. Macau is only an hour's ferry ride from Hong Kong. When Hong Kong fell, one tiny British steamer allowed itself to be interned in the Portuguese harbor. There it's remained till now. 
But the Japs, this incident demonstrates, are getting very hard up indeed for shipping. 200 tough Japanese soldiers steamed 10 days ago into the mud-filled Macau port. The Portuguese authorities resisted. Necessarily, it was a weak resistance. The little city of Macau that covers the whole island has no great importance. It makes its living by the manufacture of firecracker and joss sticks, and from the revenue of wide-open gambling dens and opium-smoking parlors. Twenty Portuguese neutrals were killed in the scuffle. The Japs took the British ship and sailed away with it. On the Russian fronts today, battles in all sectors have resulted in the killing of 5,200 more German troops. In the fighting around the newly retaken town of Sesk, a considerable quantity of Nazi military equipment has been collected by the army. The Russian midnight communique runs to 16 paragraphs. In not one of them does the Soviet Union fail to report some definite success against the Germans. By the way, while we are on the subject, there has been a great deal of talk in the United States recently, much of it rather dangerous talk, about the possibility of Russia someday, for reasons unexplained and unexplainable, making a separate peace with Germany. It now appears that the Germans themselves have no use for that nonsensical line of thought. An official Nazi spokesman today made this statement, I quote, in connection with uncontrolled rumors about alleged or possible contact between Berlin and Moscow, only weapons will decide in the East. The German object remains the final annihilation of Bolshevism. It's been estimated that the British bombing raid last night on Nuremberg may have been the hardest in history. Nuremberg is the sentimental capital of the German National Socialist Party. It was the scene of the terrifyingly dramatic annual Nazi Congresses. That ancient medieval city has, too, the black distinction of having given its name to the infamous Nuremberg Laws adopted by Germany for the systematic annihilation of the Jews. But Nuremberg is also the crossroads of three great generations. It is an important garrison city of the German army. Its factories produce many important machines of war. The London Dispatch describes the raid as literally a shattering success. German defenses were alert and plentiful. They completely failed nevertheless to keep the huge squadron of four-motored bombers from flying back and forth over the target area for two uninterrupted hours. The old city of Nuremberg, where the famous Iron Maiden and the relics of previous generations of German torturers have been gaped at by countless tourists, lies within a wall surrounded by a moat. The industrial districts are outside it. There is therefore a fair chance that the historic quarter of the town may have escaped serious damage. There is more news today from Argentina. The cause of fascism in our own hemisphere, lacking only the title, has scored a new advance. The oligarchic government of General Mar Ramirez has decreed that all Argentine naturalized aliens whose ideas do not perfectly agree with that of the government in power will be deprived of their citizenship. While we fight for the four freedoms, the rebel Argentine government, to which we promptly granted full diplomatic recognition, has been suppressing those freedoms with notable efficiency. And a distracted world has given little heed to what was going on. And that's all just now. It's common knowledge among a lot of unhappy wartime motorists that the harder you step on the gas, the more fuel your car is bound to use. And it seems to me that the same thing is true of us and the work we do. The harder we work, the more fuel we're likely to need. The more we can use the abundant food power of our highly nourishing foods like whole wheat. Remember, when you enjoy Wheaties for breakfast, you're getting whole wheat's concentrated food power in full measure all the well-known essential nourishment of this basic cereal grain. And remember, too, that Wheaties are a plentiful food, so enjoy these toasted flakes often. You can be sure that you really help to prepare yourself for a busy day when you start your morning meal with milk and fruit and Wheaties, breakfast of champions. This program is presented every Friday and Saturday evening by General Mills, makers of Wheaties. During John Gunther's present tour of the war fronts, we have the privilege of presenting Mr. Gunther's close friend and colleague, John W. Vandercook. We invite you to listen next Friday evening for the next program in this series. Glenn Riggs speaking. John W. Vandercook came to you from New York. This is the Blue Network.